is Lyft getting to the public markets before its rival. Uber has had more mind share and market share almost every step of the way. But today, Lyft got a chance to run a victory lap. Lyft board member and Andreessen Horowitz general partner Ben Horowitz says the fact that Lyft survived its fight with Uber, let alone got public first, would have surprised almost anyone a few years ago. We caught up with Horowitz earlier today to talk about Lyft's IPO and its competition. It's like uh, Rocky Balboa winning the heavyweight championship of the world. Like, it's like that. I mean, you know, all these founders in Silicon Valley go, oh, nobody believed in us. When John Logan said it, they're telling the truth. Like, you know, like literally, no, everybody had written them off. And for them to come back and go from, you know, when I stepped onto the board, I think we we're at about 16% share in the U.S. and we're at 39% today. So just amazing. Like, really, really a thrilling thing. The thing is, Uber isn't just a competitor. They're a fierce competitor. And, and you know, in some cases, they resorted to illegal things. Yes, to highly illegal tactics. Beat sure. their competition. John and Logan, I just spoke to them, they say they don't think about the competition. But come on. I mean, how much do you have to think about the competition in a situation like this? Well, I think that we think about it less now than we did. Um, but, yeah, no, like, it was a huge force. Um, and it was pervasive in everything. So it wasn't just... Competition one, like you know, Uber of course stole the original Lyft idea, so it was that kind of competition. And there was competition for drivers and competition for passengers. But Uber actually went as far as when Lyft was raising money, they would call investors and threaten them. Uh, you know, like you, you'll literally you'll never do business in this town again. You know, if you invest in Lyft, like and Uber investors would call, the benchmark guys would call and threaten investors. And so, like really, really aggressive competition. So of course, you know, there were some thoughts about. It. Uh, but they did, John and Logan did a great job of creating their own vision for the future of transportation and, you know, like how you treat people, how you treat drivers, how you treat passengers that, you know, established a great position for them in the market. Uh, really exciting. Those are some pretty bold accusations that Uber stole the business model and Benchmark would call and threaten. Oh, yeah. Well, like, they're not like, you can check that with anybody. Check any anybody who tried to invest, I'll tell you that. And then um, they clearly, like, Uber started out as black car. Like, this is, you know, they copied it. Stole us, too, because you don't, you don't steal things like that in business. They copied it. Um, but, yeah, I mean, like, Lyft was ride-sharing, and Uber was black car. And then when Uber saw Lyft taking off, they adopted the ride-sharing. So, you know, that, that stole, copied. So Uber has worked hard to rebuild their reputation. Yeah. Does that make it harder for you now that Uber is sort of back on its feet? Uh, well, actually, I think not. Um, and here's why uh, Travis, for all his aggressiveness, was an amazingly competent um, founder CEO and a very tough competitor. And I think that uh, with the change, with the change in management, Uber has lost a lot of talent, a lot of people. We've hired a lot of them at Lyft. Uh, so I think that, and you can see it in the numbers, we're getting stronger and stronger as a competitor. And, you know, look, the delete Uber thing was a short burst that got us to, from like 16 to 22 percent share. The 22 to 39 percent has been, you know, against the new management team. So you think Dara Khosrowshahi is not doing a good job? Well, I just think it's hard to take over somebody else's company who had such a pronounced culture, such a specific way of doing things that you're trying to change. I think that's a hard task. And so, they, you know, look, they, they're occupied with that. Now, you've seen a lot of business models invested in a lot of companies, started your own companies, run your own companies. Lyft is making $2.2 billion a year. They're losing almost half that. How do they bring their costs down? And how quickly can they realistically bring those costs down? Yeah, so I think the costs have gone down significantly, you know, particularly as a percentage of revenue over the last year. And the unit economics on the core business work very well. Now, they've got two business, new businesses that they're investing in, autonomous vehicles and bikes and scooters. And those will continue to be investments. But I think the, the core ride-sharing business is on its way to, well on its way to profitability. So what's the argument to investors that this is a 20, maybe $25 billion company when it is losing that much money? It's the future of transportation. And you, know, you, you believe uh, that in the future, things are we're not, we're not going to all be stuck in traffic in our own cars. Um, Lyft is the best company in that market, and it's a, you know transportation is an enormous market. It's an enormous opportunity, and 
at least, you know, in my view, uh, it's an opportunity to invest in the very best company in, in that market. So what does that future look like to you and how much is self-driving technology part of it? Uh, so, you know, it's a little bit remains to be seen, but I think it's certainly going to be a, a real factor. And, um, and then, but the, the network itself is going to be a factor. I think we're going to have drivers for much longer than people anticipate. There are things that uh, humans are really good at, like bad weather and weird places and all these things that it's, you know, much harder to get a computer to do. Um, but it'll be a big factor and it, it will change the economics and change the landscape. But we think that the network, like owning the network, the, which is a huge investment, as you pointed out, um, is just a wonderful position to be in and, and positions lift to lead us to the future. John mentioned that you know they're always thinking about international. And if they do expand internationally, it'll be in markets where there's only one competitor, one real player. Yeah. You know, what might those markets be? Well, I, I shouldn't forecast the business because I'm just a board member. But like, I think there's we have a lot of knowledge about what the best markets are. You know, uh, where the profits are in the business and so forth. And I think that um, you know, well, as I said, as he said, pick our spots and do things that make a lot of sense for the business. But are you comfortable not expanding internationally right now? Oh yes, because you know one of the things we're doing, and you know we just rang the bell in one of Lyft's new service centers. You know, like most people don't know, Lyft has these service centers, which you know in the U.S. we can really help drivers. We can help them with the tax laws. We can help them uh, get their car service. We can help them really succeed and make more money. And that's much easier to do when you have like a sharp domestic focus like we do. And we're really committed to that. And you know we just did a a big new program with the city of Los Angeles around that. And I think that, you know, if you're spread out internationally, you can't do that with the same intensity that we're able to do it. Companies are waiting a lot longer to go public. Lyft was one of them. And this year, we're going to see a flood of IPOs, potentially Uber, maybe Airbnb, uh, Slack, Pinterest. How high are your expectations for these IPOs, given that this is a new trend? These companies have been building for a long time, yeah. and now they're coming out of the game. I think all the companies you named are very high quality companies, you know, with uh, excellent businesses, tremendous un unit economics, um, good management teams, and so forth. So I think that's going to be healthy for the IPO market in that my experience through this is when high quality companies go public, it's great for everybody, it's great for the market, it's great for the companies, it's great for investors, it's great for the country. When low quality companies go public, which you know in my era uh, a lot of us did, um, you know that goes the other way. So I, I have uh, high hopes. I don't know if I have expectations, but um, it's an exciting time. Do you think we'll see though, like a snap where it goes out to all this fanfare, twenty plus billion dollar valuation, and then sort of now is a third of that? Well, look, anything is always possible. I think that uh, that was a very company specific kind of event that occurred. Um, and I think Snap went public much earlier in its maturity cycle than these other companies have. But is there as much value today for public market investors? Uh, well, I think that you know one of the tragedies of the last kind of 20 years of regulation has been we have many fewer public companies. And so Microsoft went public when it was worth $300 million. And Amazon, I think, was worth $300 million. That can't happen today because of the way, uh, you know, everything from Reg FD to short order handling rules and so forth just made it too dangerous to do that. So I think that's um, sad. On the other hand, these companies do have a lot of runway in front of them. Uh, because they have enormous market opportunities. So does that mean there's more value for you then? Because you just hired a partner to focus on late stage growth companies. Where do you see the opportunities for the sort of next wave of hot tech? Yeah, so I, I think that um, a lot of the value has shifted from the public to the private markets. And that's the, I, I think that's something that we as a country need to figure out how to correct because it creates the wealth gap. I mean, when you're in the private markets, you have to be at least an accredited investor, which means you have to have you know more than a million dollars to invest in these high-growth companies. Um, 
it was done to protect individual investors, but I think it's taken away too much opportunity. So I think that's definitely true. I, you know, it's great that we have high quality companies going public, which are opportunities. It'd be better if there were more of them. So um, I'm hopeful that you know we can start to re reform the, now that we know what's happened, we can reform the regulation and make it both safe and create the opportunities in the public market. So now that you have this sort of barbell strategy at Andreessen Horowitz, where is the next hot tech thing? I mean, if it's not social networking or the sharing economy, yeah. what is it? Yeah, well, I think that's the last 10 years. So, you know, <laughs> social network, the sharing economy, mobile apps. Right. Um, I think what we're seeing now are things like AI, uh, Cryptocurrency and blockchain, AR and VR, bi biotech, uh, particularly computational biology, are some of the areas that are new platforms that uh, we see great opportunities in the next 10 years. Do you have any concerns about China? And there's some you know, controversy around the working conditions there for tech workers. Do you have mm -hmm. any concerns about China surpassing the United States in, in technology? Well, look, I think China doing well and growing over the, you know, since uh, you know, you know, since the Cultural Re Revolution and um, and kind of opening their markets and 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 succeeding is one of the greatest things that's happened to the world, mm -hmm. like period. And I think that's it's been great for the United States so far that China is successful and not just you know a billion mud farmers, uh, which is what it was coming out of. So, like, that's all being incredibly positive. And I don't think countries don't compete uh, in the way companies compete. So, like, the way to think about it, it's like, if Arizona is doing well, like, it doesn't really hurt California. Uh, and if China is doing well, it doesn't really hurt the United States. In fact, it makes us both better. So, you know, I'm excited about it. Um, China is very different, though. And, you know, it is, uh, there are, th there's plenty of room for U.S. companies, I would say, even if China is massively successful. Some of my conversation there with Ben Horowitz, general partner at Andreessen Horowitz. Bloomberg LP, the parent company of Bloomberg Television, is an investor in Andreessen Horowitz.